This morning's lesson scripture before Brock brings us the lesson will come from Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 16. Luke 15, 11 through 16. Then he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. Day in and day out, people go into eternity unprepared. Who is to blame? Who is to blame for people going into eternity unprepared? Well, some blame God. They may say, if God wanted me saved, then he would have saved me. Well, that's wrong. 1 Timothy 2.4 says, who will have all men to be saved. And to come unto the knowledge of the truth. God desires for everyone to be saved. Some blame others. It's so and so's fault that I did such and such. Well that's wrong too. 1 John 3, 4 says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. Sin is something we commit. Sin is not something we catch. Everyone who loses their soul has no one to blame but self. Jesus said in Mark 8, 36 and 37, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Others can certainly help or hinder, but don't lose sight of this one simple fact. Individuals are lost because of personal sin. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Jesus is often called the master teacher and for good reason. If you paid attention to how the Sermon on the Mount ends in Matthew 7, 28 and 29, it came to pass when Jesus had ended these things, the people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. John 7.46, the officers answered, never man spake like this man. Parables were one of the teaching methods used by Jesus. Today we're going to be looking at a parable of Jesus in Luke 15. Perhaps it is the pinnacle of all the parables. The word parable means a placing of one thing by the side of another for the purpose of comparing. But who knows that definition, right? We don't, we don't learn that one. What is a parable? A parable is an earthly account with a heavenly meaning. That's what we understand a parable to be, and it is correct. Parables were designed to both reveal the truth and to conceal the truth. The honest and good heart can understand the simplicity of the parables while the dishonest heart considers them silly. Look with me in Luke 15, beginning in verses 1 through 3. We're going to see that this chapter really is a single parable that is illustrated three ways. Sheep, silver, silver. And then really two sons. You can remember three S's, can't you? But guess what? That's not, that's not the points of the sermon. Luke 15, 1. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes, the religious, I would call them geniuses of the day, murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Now look how it says in verse 3. And he spake this parable one. This parable singular unto them. Who's them? Well, perhaps we'll be able to grasp some of this as we move forward. Today, let's talk about reclaiming the wayward. Reclaiming 
the wayward. We want to look at Luke 15. Really, we're going to look today from verses 11 through 32 from three different perspectives. And here's the first one. We're going to look first from the perspective of the lost. Generally, we know him as the prodigal son, though the Bible doesn't really call him that. But he is the lost son. We'll say he's the sinful son. Perhaps it would be accurate to call him the foolish son. We're going to look at that first. Then second, we're going to look from the perspective, and if you take notes, put this in quotations, from the perspective of the loyal son. He's the loyal son out of his own mouth. Perhaps we could call him the scornful son. The Bible says he was angry. Perhaps we could call him the furious son. But we're going to look at things from his perspective too. And then third, we're going to look from the perspective of the Lord. And we know him to be the Savior. Perhaps in this instance it would be the Father. Three things, the lost, the loyal, and the Lord. Let's begin in the text at Luke 15, beginning in verse 11, as we consider this third illustration, as it seems, of the same parable from the perspective of the lost. Look at Luke 15, verse 11. And he, that still Jesus, said, A certain man had two sons. Observe that. A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. Notice the next sentence. And he, that's the father, divided unto them. That's two, isn't it? The elder son and the younger son. He divided unto them his living. The strong implication of this parable moving forward is that these two sons are Jewish. So the requirement under the law of Moses for what was to happen with the father's property was found in passages such as Deuteronomy 21, 17. The man had two sons, so what he would do is he would take all his property and divide it by three. The elder son received a double portion, so when you have one other brother, he received two-thirds. And then the younger son, since he was the younger and didn't receive a double portion, he received a third of the father's total property. Now look at verse 13. And not many days after... The younger son, this is the emphasis, this is the lost, gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. Now what did he do while he was there? And there wasted his substance with riotous living. Far country here, I think we would all agree, really implies and really means the depths of sin. We often go farther in sin than we ever anticipate, don't we? Sin always ends up costing us far more than we ever want to pay. There's a high cost with sin. Look at verse 14. How much did he spend? And when he had spent all. There's no reason to limit all. He's penniless. He spent every dime that he had. Everything that he had, he spent it all. And when he had spent all, uh-oh, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Notice the contrast there. Verse 13, he gathered all together. Verse 14, he spent all. He got it all together. He went into a far country, and he did what? He spent everything that he had. Now, I wonder if you'd ask him at this point, hey, has it been worth it? Was it worth it? Was it worth it for you to ask your daddy for all your inheritance while you're still alive and now you've gone off and spent everything? Now there's a famine. What are you going to do? Was it worth it? I wonder if you could have asked him right there at that point. The last time he laid his last little bit of money down, wonder what he'd have said. Well, let's keep reading. Verse 15. What happens? And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he, that's the citizen of that country, sent him, the younger son, into his fields to feed swine. You understand this would have been repulsive to a Jew. And how high would that be on your to-do list? How do we express it? He's basically sent to go slop the pigs. How high up is that on your to-do list today? Hey, you know what? I don't have any money. Will you give me a job? Yeah, I'll give you a job. What do you want me to do? Go out there and slop the pigs. You say, yay. <laughs> Just what I wanted to do. So this would have been definitely repulsive to him, especially if he were a Jew. But think about it from our perspective. Is that really what you want to do? Is that really how you want to make a living? Is to go out and have to do that? Probably not. Look at verse 16. Look. 
and he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. He is famished, and he is forsaken. Why? I reckon because he just decided he needed everything. He needed to go experience life for a little while, didn't he? Now, there's some of the, I guess you would say, the explanation, and really the application of this principle comes in verses 17 through 19. So what does this mean? What can we take from what we just read? We're going to see it really applied in verses 17 through 19, and the word we're looking at is humility. Humility. Verse 17. I don't know if you mark in your Bibles, but you need to write this down. You need to highlight this. You need to do whatever it is. And when he came to himself, observe, the younger son made up his own mind. No one made up his mind for him. No one made this decision for him. His daddy did not go bail him out. He hit the bottom on his own, and he knew what he had to do. And he knew where he had to go to make things right. When he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough in despair? And I perish with hunger. I will arise. Notice, he's made a determination in his mind. I will arise. And go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned. Notice that. When was the last time those three words came out of our own mouths? I have sinned. Don't worry about my neighbor has sinned. Don't worry about anybody else. I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Can you imagine eating that slice of humble pie right there? You ever, had a t you ever had a taste of humble pie? That's humble pie right there. You understand there's really no such thing really as humble pie to my knowledge. But that's a figure of speech. He had to really come to his own realization, didn't he? That what he had done, he messed up. Nobody made this mess for him. He made his own mess. Humble pie might taste bad, but it's awful good for the soul. Let me give you some passages you might want to connect in your mind with this. It begins in James 4.10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. That's what this younger son had to do. Let me give you another one to attach with that. It's 1 Peter 5, 6 and 7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Perhaps the strongest one we need to learn is found in Romans 2.4. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? What did he say in his mind? I got to go back home. It was the goodness of his father that caused him to come to his own self and his own mind and say, I, you know what? Home's not that bad. I need to go home. Now, there's the perspective of the lost. Now, let's move on. We're not going to look at the text in the order that it's laid out. We're going to skip ahead in the chapter and look in the second place at the perspective of the loyal, all right? The loyal son. Skip ahead with me to Luke 15, and let's look at verses 25 through 30. Now, the Bible says, his elder son was in the field. What do you reckon he was doing in the field? I'd say he was working, wouldn't you? Now, his elder son was in the field, and as he came... And drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. Now, we're going to see, and I think this would make sense, the elder son in this example of the parable represents those murmuring Pharisees and scribes. That's who the elder son represents. Now, know this. Every single point of a parable does not have to be pressed into having a New Testament application. Does this verse teach... That instrumental music and dancing are authorized in New Testament worship? No, it doesn't. Don't, don't try to press every single point of a parable into saying, oh, they're here. Since, since we see his elder son, he came down to the house, he heard music and dancing, it means instrumental music and dancing in New Testament worship. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. Don't press it to mean any more than what it does. Verse 26, and he, that's the elder son, called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. Now, what do you think was going through his mind? I can see what would be going through my mind if I was him. Hey, 
My father has finally recognized my superiority. He has finally come to his senses and realized how loyal of a son I really am. You know, here my younger brother's run off and he's done squandered all and it was apparently pretty well known. But I've been here the whole time, faithful, working out here in this field like I'm supposed to do. That would probably be what was going through my mind. I don't know if that would be what was going through your mind, but that probably would have been mine if I were him. Verse 27, he gets his answer. And he, that's the servant, said unto him, the elder son, thy brother is come. I can hear ominous music in my mind. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> the unbelievable has happened. What? Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. Now, how would you act? How do we act, brethren? Because that's going to be the application of this. How do we act when the lost return home? How do we act? Verse 28, is this our attitude? And he was angry? Let that sink in just for a second. The elder brother is angry. In essence, because his younger brother, who has squandered all with riotous living, has returned home. And how did the father treat him? He's killed the fatted calf. They're rejoicing. Isn't that a sorry attitude? He was angry and would not go in. He ain't having no part of that. That's his brother, by the way. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. Observe that the father went out and tried to reason with him, with his own son about. Number one, the father's own actions, and number two, about his own brother. Got to go talk to his own son about this. Look at verses 29 and 30. Now watch. And he, this is the elder son, answering, said to his father, Lo, while he landed on thick, okay? Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. Notice those personal pronouns. I, my, it's all about me and I, isn't it? But, now notice the language of the Bible. Well, Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. He told this exactly how it needed to be told. But as soon as this, thy son, he didn't say my brother, all of a sudden he's shifting the blame. That's the way the loyal do things. As soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, that probably is true, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. You know, this is typical. This is typical. Most depict themselves in the best light possible with no recollection of any personal wrongdoing, yet remember with amazing and unshakable certainty every transgression and sin that everyone else ever did in the history of the world. Isn't that amazing? I have never transgressed your commandment ever at any time, not once ever. Didn't we say for all have sinned? Didn't the Bible say that and come short of the glory of God? But yet somehow when it comes time to internalize that scripture, it's all y'all. All y'all have sinned. That's what the Bible says, isn't it? All y'all. It doesn't say me. Well, I'm implied in all too. And so are you. So are we all who are of the age of accountability and of a sound mind. You know what's the lesson here that we can see from this? It's one simple word and it is hypocrisy. Despite the clear teaching of the Bible and to their own shame, some still grow angry and envious when others are blessed. Even members of the church become angry and envious when people come up here to repent of their sins and confess them openly. What are you getting mad for? Why? That's what they're supposed to do. That's what we're supposed to do, isn't it? Instead of rejoicing when the lost come home, the law-making loyal loathe the humility of the humble. Loathing the humility of the humble is known throughout Scripture as the sin of hypocrisy. Let me give you some, something to think about. 
First one came out of the mouth of Jesus in Matthew 15, 7 and 8. He said, ye hypocrites. That's what the Lord said. Well did his science, that's Isaiah, prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips. But their heart is far from me. Is that what we're doing right now? Are we all offering lip service to the Lord? Knowing that if someone, if the lost were to actually come home, we're mad and resentful. Is that the attitude of a New Testament Christian? Not a faithful one. Not one that's planning on living in heaven with the Lord forever. Let me give you another one. It's in 1 John 4 and verse 20. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, what, what is he, John? He's a liar. That's what John says by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? Well, there's the perspective of the lost and the perspective of the loyal. Now, let's get to the meat and potatoes. Because what we're looking at is the perspective in the third place of the Lord. That's what we want to see. How is the Lord going to handle all this? First, let's consider the Lord's perspective to the lost. Back up to Luke 15 and verse 20. This is one of the most beautiful verses in the Bible when you grasp it. If you don't grasp it, it's just words on a page. Luke 15 and verse 20, And he arose, the younger son arose, and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Notice that once the father saw his son, he did not yell or wait or lecture or swing or swear. What did he do? He ran. Did he run and give him the old Russian sickle? Say, I'm on clothesline. Where have you been? You don't run off from me like that, ever. I didn't read that in the text, did you? He didn't give him the old Russian sickle. He didn't clothesline him. What did he do? He ran and fell on his neck. That's probably Bible language indicating he hugged him. And what did he do? He kissed him. You know, there really is no more beautiful picture of God's love in the Bible than that verse right there. Look at verse 21. Now notice, the son determined in his mind something to do. But once he determined it, he demonstrated it. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Notice he demonstrated what he determined. Look at verses 22 through 24. And notice this, honor comes after humility, not before. Honor comes after humility is demonstrated, not determined. Notice it. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and be merry for, when you see for, say why. Here's the reason. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be married. What's the point? Honor comes after humility, not before. When was the son honored? Not while he was slopping with the pigs in sin. Do you realize that? Not when he determined in his mind what he was going to do. He had to determine it and then he had to go demonstrate it. And then he was honored. But now let's consider it from the perspective of the Lord to the loyal son. Skip down to verses 31 and 32. You know what you're going to see right here? You're going to see six simple reminders that perhaps everyone here needs to be reminded of who's a member of the church. Verse 31, and he said unto him, now notice, here's the elder son who's angry. He said unto him, number one, son. That means you're my son still. Number two, thou art ever with me. That means you're always around me. Number three, and all that I have is thine. Everything that was left, who was going to get it? The elder son. So everything here is yours. Verse 32, number 4, it was meet that we should make merry and be glad. In other words, this was the right thing to do. When your lost brother, my lost son, came home, this was the right thing to do. 
For this, number five, thy brother, he is still your brother. Isn't he? Was the father wrong in what he said? No, he wasn't wrong. This thy brother was number six, dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. He was gone and lost, but number seven, he is here and happy and healthy. You know what probably most fathers would say? Stop pouting. Get in there and act like you've got some sense. You understand that? Stop this foolishness. You're missing the forest for all these trees that are in your way. Your dead brother is back. And you're mad about it. How can that be? So what does this mean for us? It's a double-barreled one. And of course, they're going to start with H. It is healing and hope. Even though we have made a mess, our spiritual lives can be healed. What did that younger son do? He made a mess. He made a mess. He was lost and dead in that condition, wasn't he? But he knew where to go. Wonderful, we do. We can be prepared for eternity. And then what's the other aspect? It is hope. Because hope awaits the heavy-hearted and the humble, not the haughty. I'll give you some scripture. It came out of Jesus' mouth. Most people call it the great invitation. It's in Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Have we run away from our spiritual home? Do we wonder if God will ever have us again? Friend, know this. God desires us to return home. He is pleading with everyone here by means of his word. Perhaps some want to come home, but they don't know what to do. Well, I'm going to tell you what to do. You've got to obey God's plan of salvation. And you must obey it now from the heart. And let God reclaim your wayward soul. What must I do to come home? You've got to hear the truth. Acts 18.8. You've got to believe the truth. Acts 16.31. Repent of sin. Acts 17.30. Confess openly and freely Jesus Christ to be the Son of God. Acts 8.37. You must be immersed in water for the remission of sins so that the blood of Jesus Christ will wash away all those past sins, Acts 2.38. Then the Lord has added you to his church, Acts 2.47, the church of Christ, Romans 16.16. 16. You may say, I did that years ago, but I ran off. Okay, there's hope for you too. It's called Acts 8.22. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. Are you going to come home? Let's see. As together we stand and as we sing the song of encouragement.